We are iConnections, and it's time to talk about change. To work together and rebalance our global systems. To create a more equitable world for everyone. To celebrate women and their achievements. Acknowledge their trials and their triumphs. To challenge biases and recognize that the leadership of women is essential. We choose to invest in our future because equality is non-negotiable for investment. And change emerges from leadership. We must overcome discrimination, challenge gender inequality, and balance our responsibilities. Every challenge comes with a choice. I choose to challenge. I choose to challenge. We, we choose, choose to challenge. challenge. our next session, which shares the perspective of trade bodies on the challenges faced with inclusion in our industry. This session is sponsored by KPMG, one of the world's leading providers of audit, tax, and advisory services with 150 years of experience. Trade bodies and the leaders within those organizations can accelerate change, scrutinize decisions, and influence policy. Our next panel asks these leaders how they themselves choose to challenge gender inequality and what the road ahead looks like from their point of view. I'm excited to introduce Michelle Noyes, Managing Director of AMA. Michelle joined AMA in 2012 as Chief Operating Officer of AMA's New York office and became the Association's Head of Americas in 2017. We also welcome Gorpreet Manku, Deputy Director General and Director of Policy at BVCA. She is responsible for leading the response to a wide range of issues and challenges facing the industry. Joining them is Jacqueline Taiwo, Associate General Counsel at Towerbrook Capital Partners and co-founder of Black Women in Asset Management, a nonprofit organization that connects and empowers black women working in our industry. We also welcome Shana Johnson, Principal at Grosvenor, where she leads strategy and corporate development and advises industry-leading clients in portfolio and partnership accounting, business process, and regulatory compliance. Welcome to all of our guests, and we hope you enjoy the session. Thank you everyone for joining our discussion today on trade bodies and the challenges that we see ahead. I have an amazing panel of women that are, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with them. I'll start with having them introduce themselves and briefly their organization before we head into the questions. I'm gonna start with the order of my screen. And so I'm gonna start with Michelle. Hi, good morning, Shana, and good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Noyes and I head the Americas for AMA which is the global not-for-profit trade association in the alternative investment industry. We have a 31-year legacy, 2,000 corporate members with offices all over the world. I personally started my AMA journey as a volunteer when I worked with a hedge fund in Sao Paulo, um, but these days are in, am in New York and look after all of our members in North and South America. Thanks, Michelle. Jackie? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jackie Tylo. I am Associate General Counsel at Towerbrook Capital Partners, and I am also the co-founder of Black Women in Asset Management. Um, BWAM is a nonprofit organization based here in London that supports the retention and advancement of Black women working in the asset management industry across all investment strategies. Our mission is to see more Black women step into senior leadership roles. Currently, we have over 450 members who represent a wide, broad cross-section of the industry, including investment professionals um, and women who work in the front office, but also lawyers like myself, um, consultants, women in investor relations, sales, operations, compliance, accounting, product design, all, all different roles. In terms of what we do, um, our activities fall into four main pillars. The first is professional development. Um, we do a lot of, or we offer a lot of events on leadership development um, and how to navigate bias. 
um, so that women are armed with the tools needed to succeed. Um, we also host events that are focused, is focused really on networking because we all know how important social capital is. So we um, offer events that help women in the organization form relationships and cultivate, cultivate relationships that help them really build their business. Um, we also participate in a lot of outreach initiatives to help encourage more young women enter into the investment industry. And finally, we, we spend a lot of time advocating for change by promoting practices and policies that lead to more inclusive workplaces. Perfect, thanks, Jackie. Reprise. Hi, I'm, I'm Gerpreet Banku. I'm the BVCA's Deputy Director General, and I look after all our policy work here. The BVCA represents private equity and venture capital firms that have a base in the UK. So as well as including lots of firms that have establish themselves here. We also have members that are based overseas um, and in Europe. Um, our membership uh, spans 700 firms and that includes GP, so private equity, venture capital firms, growth capital firms, some alternative lenders as well, LPs, including funder funds, um, and the advisory community. Perfect, thank you. And I'm Shana Johnson, principal at GCM Grover, but I'm also a member of the National Association of Investment Companies, uh, their Women in Asset Management Advisory Board. And so looking at women in alternatives, Jackie of Black Women in Asset Management, between AMA and BVCA, tell me a little bit about not just how your organizations are supporting the industry and the firms, but how are you supporting individuals and professionals like myself? And I'll start with Michelle. Sure, no, so at AMA, we do look to be a practical resource for our members. Um, so to your first point, we do quite a lot with the firms themselves who often don't have HR departments, let alone you know, a dedicated DNI or DEI effort. So by equipping them with the tools to understand what their peers are doing, what are some ways that they can continue to grow and engage. We help them create these inclusive cultures and these diversity policies that will hopefully also help the individuals. Beyond that, we do try to shine a spotlight on some of the, the great work being done by more specific affinity groups on the front lines, um, be that fantastic groups like Jackie's or 100 Women in Finance, Women in Funds, Black Hedge Funds Professional Network, um, where I'm on the advisory board, because they have you know, these really wonderful groups of individual cohorts and individual members. Um, and then be, further to that, we also do have a careers panel um, that one of my colleagues started in London that does look at how individuals can also progress personally within their own careers. So we really try to attack it at a multi-pronged level and also very um, in partnership, I would say, with other organizations and individuals. Thank you, Jackie. Sure. I mean, well, as a as we're not a trade um, association, we're more of a member association. So basically, all of the events we we hold are in support of members. Um, you know, we we did originally start as a networking group, um, quite selfishly. I, I co-founded the organization because I, I wanted to connect and meet other Black women in the industry. I've I've been um, you know here in London working in private equity since 2009, and, and in European PE, you just do not come across many. Well, you don't come across many women, especially not many other Black women. Um, so what was really great about the group and how it formed was that we started just by having these networking dinners in London, where it was like an amazing time for the women to come together and just laugh and get to know each other and share experiences. And what we found was that the list just kept growing and growing and these dinners were turning into these really amazing um, and fantastic spaces for peer mentorships. And it was just clear that this was something that was missing and really needed in the industry to support this group of, of women. And, you know, I can't describe how empowering it is to walk into a room and sit at a table of 
20 inspirational and aspirational women who understand you, understand your journey and are rooting for you to succeed and are going through the same challenges. And, and it's just incredibly powerful. Um, and so, you know, I think that out of everything that we do as an organization, that networking, um, that peer mentorship is so, so important. And um, that's why, you know, huge part of what we do and what we want to continue to do to, to support women and to support their career growth. Absolutely. And Gerprit, you mentioned in our prep session that your organization has expanded from just looking at gender diversity to looking at the broader DEI conversation. So tell me a little bit more about that expansion and what you're doing there. So we, so we you know, very much like Jackie was saying, started off with these networking events, gosh, I think probably 15 years ago. And they're very much tailored to, just towards women, um, events where they could catch up with over dinner, like you said, but then you also went into discussions about business activities. Um, after a while, I remember thinking, well, why are we having a separate women's event to talk about fundraising when we already have a fundraising event? So let's, um, let's just make sure women are represented at the broader fundraising event. And we, we what, what, uh, started to spend a bit more time on ensuring there's more representation across events more generally. We then formalised our strategy, making it very clear that the BBCA's role as a trade body for the industry was to increase the participation of women in the industry and representation in senior roles. And that continued for a few years before expanding out to cover all aspects of DNI, looking at ethnicity as well as um, socioeconomic backgrounds um, and sexual orientation as well. So our event series certainly did expand. And I remember, um, I think my first event, which is probably where I met Jackie, um, looking um, to, to bring people from, from different ethnic back backgrounds together. And I remember leaving that event thinking, gosh, even I didn't know there were that many people in the, in the industry um, from, from similar backgrounds and um, le left feeling quite motivated to do more. So over the past few years, we've been looking at what we can actually do as an association to support the industry um, and to, to ensure that it helps firms meet their objectives. We've got a four pillar approach. The first looks at research and publications, which I'm going to talk to a little bit later. Um, within publications, uh, we recently um, put, put out some best practice guidelines that were written by investors in the industry. They look at not only um, diversity and inclusion at a firm level, but what you can implement when you're looking to make investments um, into diverse founders, but also once you've invested in those businesses, how you, you've got a role there to, to promote DNI there as well. Uh, we can continue very much with our, our events and networking series because it has um, an important role. And it continues to be a forum for sharing ideas and best practices and is still one of the best attended uh, series events in our, in our calendar. Uh, we are also looking at our own governance, so ensuring that our council, so that's our board of directors and all our different committees and advisory groups, uh, represent the industry as, as we'd like it to be, so ensuring that there's, there's more representation out there. Last but certainly not least, um, there's still um, commitment to outreach. So in previous years, we've tried to promote careers in the industry through video content that people can share. Um, and we continue to support other organizations with similar um, objectives because we think that's really important. So Black Women in Asset Management, Level 20 in the UK, which is uh, looking to support women in private in venture capital. Mm -hmm and also diversity VC. There are lots of people out there with shared objectives and we're not here to reinvent the wheel, but what we are here to do is to use our convening power and our profile to champion change, so champion change, and to help uh, firms achieve, achieve those objectives. That's amazing. And some of the things that you've all spoken on is exactly what you look to your organizations to do, what firms should be looking to your organizations to do to support them in their DEI initiatives, whether it be from a recruiting standpoint and having the pipeline, but also from the programming that you guys are doing, retention as well. And so looking at that support even broader, in March of 2019, Congressman Maxine Waters um, one of my favorites, uh, Chairwoman of the House Committee of Financial Services, she delivered a call to action to address issues in the racial wealth gap, 
and also the lack of diversity in asset management. And so she issued a very distinct letter and that call to action was well received, um, but also the needed concrete steps behind it in order to respond to that. So how are trade bodies and nonprofit organizations what are they doing right now to kind of influence DEI policy within firms and answer this call to action? And Michelle, you talked a bit about what AIMA is doing in the DDQ space, but also around transparency. So I'd love you to um, speak more about that. Yeah, no, of course. So, you know, like I said, a lot of the firms in our industries are small businesses. And the heart of what AIMA has always done has been peer-to-peer -peer facilitation, education, bringing firms together for common cause to progress and to succeed. So we see this as an important part of that lens. We've always been an industry built on human capital and talent. Um, and this has you know, been increasingly centered both by government um, and regulators, but also by LPs who are asking questions more forcefully. So again, it's very important to me that we're doing things that can have a practical consequence versus just paying lip service and really leveraging who we are as an organization and what we do best to be useful, while also, again, spotlighting those organizations on the front lines. So a really important part of AMA's heritage has been what we call our sound practices and our due diligence questionnaires. So on the sound practices front, um, in November 2019, we put out a paper called The Alternatives, which really was 45 action items that firms of really any size could undertake about setting culture and building policy, about recruitment, and not just you know, a broad level question, but where do they recruit? How do they write job specs? When they get those, do they, do they anonymize it? What else can they do with that? To your point, um, how can we promote? How can we look at the, the talent that's already in our industry and continue to elevate that because sometimes I think, you know, you can look at the pipeline issues, mm -hmm. which are real, but, you know, ignore, you know, all of the fantastic faces you see on this panel today and help them succeed and help provide more visibility. Um, you know, and then we also looked at this question of influencing change, right? Um, you know, most of our members are hedge funds rather than private equity. So maybe that there's not the role on, on boards um, and some of the internal portfolio company issues but we have service providers. We can ask questions about our law firms and our brokers, about our you know, private board members, as well as you know, support those groups on the ground to succeed. So you know, we started that and we, together with those guidelines, we also provided case studies to show the work that was being done by others to, you know, to say that this is not just aspirational, but some are doing it um, mm -hmm. and here's a pathway forward. The next part of that um, was the DDQ and uh, together with Alborn Partners, the consulting company, we built on the great work that ILPA had done. So um, ILPA had put out an original due diligence questionnaire that was more private equity centric and with their blessing and permission, we expanded that to be more inclusive of other asset classes mm -hmm. and to also include different, different ways of thinking about this in terms of things like ownership. Um, so that was released in August and, you know, um, several hundred industry participants have already completed that. And it's meant to normalize this, right? It's meant to normalize these uncomfortable conversations, this transparency, which might be newer for some, um, but also make it easier to digest, make it re reduce some of those practical obstacles around it. Um, so hopefully, you know, again, there's always more to do but hopefully some of that is, is driving progress. Some of the key things you mentioned around it not being lip service. You can't just say you're doing things in DI, you actually have to evidence it. And that evidence is coming through data, right? So we have DDQs, like what you mentioned, what you guys are pulling together to pull that information. And now it's not just the LPs that are asking, you have the public asking if you're going to represent that you are in this fight and a part of this initiative and moving forward, what data do you have to support that, right? Because if it's not measured, it doesn't count. Uh, so Gurpreet, you mentioned what your organization is doing specifically around data um, and gathering the statistics to support the DEI initiative. Tell me a little bit about that. So data can be really powerful. A couple of years ago, there was a review into female entrepreneurship in the UK led by Alison Rose, who's now the CEO of NatWest. 
And at the time, she that report looked at some work we'd been doing with the British Business Bank and Diversity VC and funding going into female founders and female-led businesses. The stat came back that only 1% of UK venture funding goes into female founders. And a few years later, I'm still quoted that. So it was very powerful um, because it was so stark and so low, and it did help to spur action. Uh, we now have a treasury supported investing in women code. Several venture firms have signed up to that as, as well as banks and angel networks, and they're providing data to the treasury, to the government that can then publish to that. Um, to demonstrate where, where change and progress is, is happening. And that level of transparency is really important. Um, and another piece of work that came out of that, which we um, very much supported and, and wanted to do here as well, was a bringing together of different groups and investors to produce best practice guidelines. And I think it probably there's probably lots of similarities in the work that we recently published, plus what, um, uh, sorry, Aima has done. I was gonna say Ilpa. Ilpa's been doing lots of great work as well. Um, Aima has done recently as well. Again, so how do you implement change? What are the steps you can take regardless of how big or small your firm is? So again, a lot of that just came off the back of that, that particularly powerful statistic because it got people within government, other stakeholders and members interested um, are galvanized to do something more. Now, the other piece um, that's that's coming through is, um, well, what does the makeup of the private and venture capital industry look like? So for a few years, we've been working with and supporting reports that use publicly available data uh, to estimate the level of women in senior roles in this industry and, and women and men in investment and non-investment roles across different, different grades. Uh, but there are challenges and limitations to using uh, online data. And this year we worked with Level 20 to source that information from our members. Um, we're very close to publishing that report um, and we'll be launching it shortly with uh, another webinar to, to talk through the results. Um, that, that kind of information is helpful because it, it enables firms to think about where they how they compare to other firms of comparable sizes in the industry, but just how the industry is, is doing overall. When we last published this data, looking at, um, at public sources, the number of the, sorry, the percentage of senior women in private equity was 6%, the percentage of senior women in venture capital was 13%. Um, these are in investment roles. So the question is, well, what, what does progress look like? Now, the two reports aren't directly uh, comparable, rather, because of the way we've collected the data. Um, but it, it's, it's a way of showing um, willing and the, the fact that a number of firms have provided that data is in itself very helpful. Now, one thing that we've done this year, and again, this work started last year, is to also get information on ethnicity. And ethnicity in the UK is a protected characteristic under um, uh, data protection law. And a lot of people have said to me in the past, well, we just don't ask for that information because it's too difficult and, and we can't ask the question. And that's true in some countries in Europe, but not necessarily the case in the UK. Um, and the reason why I was personally quite keen to, um, to do something in this area was last year when um, we had the protests in support of Black Lives Matter. A lot of people were coming to me asking me, how, you know, how, what's the percentage of black people working in this industry? And I said, I genuinely don't know. I mean, I know the number's low, um, but we don't have any proper research to, to demonstrate that. So what we sought to do was um, provide a framework for collecting that information. It's on the firms to collect it. They need to survey people within their organizations. They need to respect um, legislation and ask the right questions, frame them in the right way, explain where that data is being collected and um, where, or where it will end up. And it's still on the individual to provide that information. But I think if you're doing it in a thoughtful way, you're more likely to get, um, get that information. Now, we don't have 100% um, you know, coverage of the industry compared to gender. 
but it's a start and that's the whole point it's um it's a start getting firms thinking about it providing the framework for collecting that data and we'll be publishing it shortly now um it substantiates based on what i know it substantiates what we know but it demonstrates that there is some slight progress in, in certain areas and i think that these activities are important for ongoing liaison with government and regulators. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter which country you're in. There has been a lot of work in the UK on culture and conduct. Um, a lot of work, as I've just mentioned, on, on gender. And I'm expecting there to be more around ethnicity as well. So we've got everything from codes to pay gap analysis um, to more information around where um, you know, people aren't necessarily behaving correctly and, and there are you know, regulatory obligations to report such behavior to the regulator as well, which is, which is all quite interesting. So I think it is important to have that information and, and um, publish these publications. The trade bodies are our best place to collect that information because we'll do so anonymously and, and publish it in a right way. Uh, when we when we do publish this, we will include a resources section, so links to other groups and organisations and, and other guides that can help firms as well on the journey. I think that's important in pulling the information. And to your point, it's nothing that we don't already know, especially as women in the industry. It's what we live and breathe every day. And so pulling the numbers together and really seeing it in the data, in the numbers, really helps evidence the point. Um, and also, it holds us as an industry accountable when we do this exercise again to see the numbers change. Right. Um, one of the things that I'd love to ask, and, and Jackie, I'll start with you because your organization really tackles the intersectionality between gender and ethnicity. And so what responsibility do you feel within your organization to really drive the mission of DEI? And how are you leading by example through what you're doing? Um, thanks, thanks, Shane. It's a huge responsibility. And um, I mean, it, it goes into actually the last discussion on data because, um, you know, our, our organization, we have women who not only work in private equity and hedge funds, but in, in, in the larger investment management industry. And there has been some um, reporting and, and data that came out a few years ago that showed that, um, at least in more of the, the public space, that only I believe 1% of investment managers are, are Black. And, um, you know, what's been interesting is there hasn't been much movement si since then. And I, you know, it's International Women's Day and the theme is choose to challenge. And I would just, you know, really um, challenge organizations to, you know, go to BBCA, go to um, the AI, AMA, and to ILPA, they've all published lots of information on the practices, policies, procedures. There's no excuse anymore for what do we need to do? The information is there. Go seek it out and put it into action and let's start um, moving the needle and making change. Um, you know, I, I will say that you know, Black Women in Asset Management started as a networking member organization. We really wanted to um, uplift and empower ourselves to, to advance in our careers. But actually last year, um, you know, with everything that happened with the murder of George Floyd, with the disproportionate impact of COVID, um, there was just all of these reminders and signs of just, um, you know, all throughout society telling black women and black people that their lives do not matter. And one thing that became clear from so many of my conversations with women in the organization was that despite this you know, global reckon reckoning on racism and all this awareness, a lot of women were in organizations where nothing was done, no, no one addressed it. And there was just this silence that was really, really painful for them. And you know, we realized, and, and the leadership of Wham realized that our role is more than just expanding the pipeline of women going into senior leadership. Real change needs to happen at the organization and with the men that are currently yielding power. You know, we alone cannot fix this. And so in October, we actually decided it was time to issue a public open letter calling out firms to take real action to promote racial and gender equality. Um, we found that where 
it could be daunting for one woman alone to, you know, go, go knock on her CEO's door and say, hey, I think we really need to consider doing A, B, and C. Um, our member organization, you know, we have now this collective voice representing over 400 Black women where we can use that voice, I think, to press for change. And so the letter that we issued, um, we focused on what we call the five Ps, portfolio, pipeline, promote, partnership, and policy, which means that we believe that investment firms should work towards building an anti-racist portfolio, expanding the pipeline, promoting Black women, partnering with Black women advisors, and really advocating for policy change. And you know that was actually a very tough decision for us to, to issue that letter, um, but Amazingly, well, maybe not amazingly, but we got really great feedback. It was our first moment as an organization stepping into a more advocacy role. And it just, we realized how important that was and how important that we now um, have this voice that can be repre that represent women who, you know, for so long either felt like they were alone in their organization because they were the only woman, perhaps the only woman thinking about these things and, and, and it has been impacting them and now we can give voice to them and give space to that. So it's really, it's a really important part of what we do and I think it's a huge responsibility for us as an organization to, to make sure that the issues of our members, the needs of our members, the opinions and our um, considerations are taken into account in this discussion on equity and diversity and inclusion. And Thank you. I would just add in there, I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. intersectionality and I think that's so important because for so long, the discussion about women in the workplace has really been about white women in the workplace, right? And it's important to be an ally. It's important to really, you know, have those uncomfortable conversations with yourself. And it's a journey that I am continually on um, and appreciate those around me continuing to educate me and offer those opportunities and really be intentional in doing better um, and thinking more expansively and inclusive, inclusively. So, you know, I think that this is something that's becoming more recognized. Um, of course, there's so much work still to be done. Um, but again, you have to think about it in a related fashion, um, you know, and you can't just be, you know, about just a certain, you know, sector within women in the industry. No, absolutely. And you mentioned forcing the uncomfortable conversation. That was something that you, you talked about um, and what your organization is doing and even in the presenting of the data and how that was a bit uncomfortable. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and kind of what you're doing in supporting partnership organizations having the uncomfortable conversation and the responsibility that your organization has in the space? The, it's, it's really important to, to us. When we put out a statement, um, around the Black Lives Matter protests in the UK. Um, we put that wording in around having conversations and dialogue, even if it made people feel uncomfortable. Um, and I think it's necessary because unless, unless you start on that journey, you're, you're not really going to, to have the knowledge or um, the appreciation of what needs to, to change. And we took our time before we ran our event. There were lots of events over the summer. Um, by the time we'd prepared fully, and Jackie was on that, that event, by the time we'd prepared fully, it was in, in September, I think it was Jackie, or, or early October. Mm. Um, I mean, the conversations that day were really powerful. Um, it's been shared and, and watched several times over. We had people in the industry who are black talking about their experience. And that's the first time we've done anything like that publicly. Um, and um, I, the amount of feedback we all got after uh, that event just showed why it was important um, to be having those conversations. And, and I think it is making a difference because when I, when I speak to members, diversity and inclusion is, is very high up on the agenda. People don't just talk about diversity or gender diversity on, on their own, that they mention inclusion. I think this whole subject around equity is really interesting as well. I don't think we've had that debate 
um, enough in the UK, but it, it's an important point to make. Um, just the general discussion around racism is, is, is quite a live subject, particularly, particularly this week and particularly today in the UK. And it's important that um, you know, people do talk openly um, about their experiences. And I, I link it back to, I linked it back originally to some of the, the, the work that the regulators are doing around culture and conduct, um, because they're looking out um, um, and trying to, to assess and review behaviours in, in the financial services industry. Um, but more generally, when we're thinking about our impact as an investment industry, we need to be looking beyond just financial returns and looking at how we're impacting society more broadly. Um, so as well as uh, DNI, ESG, climate change, um, other, other social issues that they're, they're getting higher and higher up firms' agenda, agendas and, and it's important for the for BBC and other trade bodies um, to help firms think about how they can actually um, you know, support those um, societal environmental objectives. And one of the things you mentioned, diversity and inclusion and the focus on the inclusion part, right? So diversity without inclusion, it's essentially just a performance, right? Uh, and so Michelle, you touched on this as it relates to allyship. And tell me about inclusion and how allyship plays such a key part in that from men in the gender conversation to non-ethnically diverse professionals in the diversity conversation. Tell me how that really impacts the inclusion piece of the conversation. Yeah, I know. And it is it is interesting because we're even seeing some firms re rename their initiatives to be mm -hmm. inclusion and diversity to really have this to step forward. Because, you know, if it's just diversity, you'll be set up to fail. Maybe you'll find someone new to bring in, but they won't be equipped to succeed and to stay and to make a difference. And, you know, we are working on a paper um, to put some concrete notions of what allyship looks like in our industry. Um, so that's still to come, but it, it's so important for someone to be able to use their privilege and say, this matters, or, you know, again, get an invitation to speak and say, okay, maybe, maybe instead of me, or maybe in addition to me, you should invite Jackie as well. She has things to say, or, or, you know, find, go out there and really source some new talent, new voices. So often the diverse, the few diverse professionals who do make it in our industry are then tasked with fixing the problem as well as being the victims of the problem. And just think about that. It's a really uncomfortable position to be in to say, actually, maybe you're racist or actually you have to fix this. If you want to succeed professionally in your deal-making abilities or in your fundraising capabilities or in your legal prowess, you, you know, it's probably not going to be, you know, a great thing for your career to have to be the person to be that uncomfortable truth teller all the time, which is why allyship is so important. Um, and it's been interesting, you know, I've just set this up with my husband. He's, you know, um, he's being much more intentional in terms of um, some gender advocacy in his own organization. While I focus you know, also on some advocacy around black and brown professionals in particular as well, um, just to make sure that we can you know, hold each other accountable and, and continue to grow um, one another. It's been really, really eye-opening. It's amazing that you're doing that and you're, you've taken the mission very personally, which is, I think should happen. We should take it personally. It should be something that we're not just working on as organizations, as leaders within our organizations for the business context, but because it's genuinely the right thing to do. Uh, and I also love what you brought up around the fixing of the problem cannot solely live with those who are impacted by the problem. Um, that is why it's so important for allyship, why it's so important for organizations like yourselves to work collectively together. And we talked a lot about that, so I do want to hit that home a bit more. Um, Jackie, you talked about the various organizations that you support, that you, know, you have collective events that you work with together because you alone can't solve the problem. Um, and so talk a little bit more about the partnership element of this and why it's helpful to have organizations like yours partner with organizations like AMA and partner with organizations like Group Reach Organization to really have a full rounded conversation around the topic and what's needed. Yeah, I mean, I think 
the one, well, first, Michelle, I love, I just have to say, I love the way you described allyship. <laughs> that was wonderful to hear. Um, but I think the responsibility, the way I see the responsibility of Black women asset management is to, as I said, be a voice for Black women and that intersectionality so that when there is a discussion on diversity, if it's about gender or if it's about race, that or or if it's about LGBTQ+, that we are looking at all of this from an intersectional lens. So that's really, really important to me. And I think that's what we bring um, to, hopefully we bring to, to partnerships. Um, and, you know, in terms of also, because once again, we, we, so our members aren't organizations, they are people. Um, and I realize that our network is, you know, a wonderful, insightful, you know, valuable network. And you, very briefly earlier, you spoke about um, recruitment and retention. And so we work with firms to help them understand how to better um, recruit Black women and to promote Black women and to retain them. And I think a lot of that is around what you've already discussed. We need to see a change at senior leadership. You need role models and sponsors and, and more people who look like you to start really changing this culture that has worked for you know one type of homogenous group for so for so long. And so in addition to working with trade bodies, we also work with organizations, investment firms to help them understand you know what we need to support us and to support um, our, our growth and to hopefully start seeing more more change at the top which, where it's needed. <laughs> Absolutely. And in our last few minutes, I'm watching the clock here, in our last few minutes, mentioned throughout that the theme for International Women's Day for the Changemakers Forum is choose to challenge. So what I'd like for each of you to do is tell me how you individually and within your organization are choosing to challenge the industry on DEI. I'll start with you. So my objective is linked to the organization as well. Um, we, like I said, have 700 members and probably about 16, 18 different boards, advisory groups and committees. Um, and I think that the gender representation could be better across some of them. And um, I'm very keen to get more senior women onto our board as well. Um, from different backgrounds. So that's my, my choose to challenge, to, to keep working to ensure that how we look on the outside is reflective of what we want the industry to be. Wonderful. Michelle? Ironically, I have to unmute myself to talk about giving voice um, to more diverse professionals. So, you know, I've been in a position in my career where I have produced a lot of panels and knowledge and content and now also continue to do that while also speaking. And I think it's so important to build visibility, um, you know, again, continue to build a pipeline of new voices, um, you know, regardless of what that looks like. So I think, in, you know, in addition as an organization, we will be more intentional in making sure that again, that reflection um, looks, I liked how Gupreet um, put it, how we wish the industry, you know, how we wish the industry or how we want it to be, um, perhaps. And sometimes that takes creativity because, you know, there are at a very senior level, um, representation is tough. So you have to be more intentional about it. Maybe you have to think about reframing the, the contours of the panel to bring in different voices. Um, but personally, what I look to do is to be more intentional in sourcing and also coaching women and other professionals who might not yet feel comfortable speaking publicly, again, about things that they are, they want to be known for. So it's not about making a diverse professional only talk about diversity, but again, talk about their deal making, talk about their investing, talking about their fundraising and give them that insight. How is it, how do you get on the, the radar of, you know, people like me, people like Eye Connections, um, putting these panels on? How do you, you know, start small and build your confidence? 
So um, I'm very happy to do that. Anyone listening, please do come and find me. But I'm also, you know, actively speaking to different groups about that. And I know, Sheena, you had mentioned that's been an important part of your own career development, speaking at an NAIC um, event and how that that really cat catapulted you in your career. So we can see that, you know, something that might seem small does have real world consequences. And that's something where I feel, you know, we can really focus on and make a change in addition to, you know, all of the other work we're doing as an organization. Thank you, Michelle. Jackie? Um, yeah, I, I have a, a quite a, I think maybe a slightly different take on the choose the challenge because in, in some ways I feel like my presence is a challenge <laughs> of itself. Um, I, I think for me, it's to have the courage to show up in these spaces and be authentic and to have a, a voice that really speaks my truth and speaks the truth that I know um, exists for so many other women who don't have the platform. Um, and so that's the challenge for me <laughs> personally is to, is to always have that courage. And when I am you know, given the opportunities to have the seat at the table to push through and make sure that I am speaking up and banging the drum for equality or just professionally in my in my role to to not be afraid to of being that only and to not let that um, hinder my progress. Thank you, Jackie. And I will take a bit of that and say that in my choose challenge and what I'm choosing to do. To your point, my presence is a challenge. Um, it's a challenge to the industry and what I want to do personally and professionally is change the narrative around the success of diverse people in this industry, the success of, the success of women in this industry, to change that narrative. This is not something that, um, it's not a problem that we're solving, but the fact that diversity, the inclusion of women and ethnically diverse professionals is actually the solution to the problems within the industry and really changing that viewpoint. And so doing that through participation with organizations like iConnections, um, working with AMA, working with you, Jackie, which I look forward to, um, and continuing to support what Gurpreet's doing with BBCA. It's important that we show up um, and as women, we show up and have our voices be heard and just being exactly what you said, just our presence is a challenge to the industry and we're demanding that they notice it. Uh, so that is my choose to challenge and how I'm going to do that throughout my career. And I look forward to challenging the industry with all of you. Um, so thank you all for your time this morning. Thank you for your amazing comments and everything that you've brought to the table. I think your organizations are going to really do something impactful in this industry. And I look forward to being a part of that with you.